What is the miracle of Pentecost? A miracle of listening or of speaking? I want us to think about this. So I want you to picture the disciples. This is just 52 days after Jesus has been executed by the state. Just 52 days. That means they haven't finished mourning, if you ever finish mourning. It means they're fearful about will they be next? Will the government come after them now because they were with Jesus? So just 52 days. And they're in this upper room where they have been meeting and gathering, where they have prayed together and ate together, where they have consoled each other and experienced the presence of God in their midst. And that day, as they gather to pray, as they gather to share a meal, the Holy Spirit came. The Holy Spirit came among them it says, like the rush of a wind with fire, little tongues of fire touching the top of their heads. And then they were able to speak. So we could say it's a miracle of tongues, right? Because the disciples were able to speak in the language of the people who needed to hear it. They were able to speak in Egyptian and Parthian. They were able to speak in all those names you all are glad I didn't make you read. They were able to speak the languages of every Jewish person in that vicinity. So it would seem that it's a miracle of the tongue, right? That these Galileans who could only speak their native language could now share the word of God to everyone. They could now share the word of God in the language that could be heard. But here's the thing it says next. It says that the people were amazed that they could hear them. So was this a miracle of the ear? Did God open up the people who weren't touched by the Spirit that day? Open up their ears so that they could hear what was being said. I learned about this way of viewing the Pentecost story from Eric Law, who is an Episcopal priest who runs the Kaleidoscope Center. And Eric Law argues that it's important to think about the Pentecost story in this way, asking the question, is this a miracle of the tongue or of the ear? Because it does two different things for us. So when we think about it, we think, oh great, <clears throat> those powerful men, those wonderful men that we think of as the, the pillars of the church, right? are able to speak to the crowds. But I want you to think about those men in terms of the people of their day. Those men weren't considered pillars of their society. They were poor fishermen. They were tax collectors. They were the people that you didn't associate with normally, that you didn't listen to. And they were given the ability to speak God's word to the people. That God's word came through the poor, the disenfranchised, the unwanted. That they were able to share the message of God. And it's the other people, the people there who had enough money to travel to Jerusalem for the holiday. Because there's a holiday going on right now. 50 days after Easter Sunday is a Jewish holiday. Those people had enough money to make that trip to Jerusalem to celebrate, right? Normal people save up a lifetime to have enough money to go on that vacation. 
So these are people who have enough means to have power in whatever location they're in. And their gift was to listen, to hear. So when Eric Law taught me this, it was in my first month of seminary. And I was not happy to be there. Because all of a sudden, they decided that we needed to spend three days together with the Lutheran Seminary and my Presbyterian Seminary and learn about Eric Claw's theory and learn about racism. And it wasn't that I was upset about the subject. I was upset that I had just moved from Connecticut and nobody had told me that I was going to have to spend three days with my son in a brand new environment, okay? So I was upset because I was worried about the little guy, because he was little then. At that event, they sat us in tables. Now the thing about my seminary, McCormick, is that it purposely tries to be diverse, meaning that in the class itself, in my class, a third of us were white, a third of us were African American, and a third of us were Korean. And of the white and the African American, there was diversity among where you came from. Meaning that I got my place because I wasn't Presbyterian. And I was from New England, so I would be odd, even though I was really from Illinois. But that's another story. <laughs> At my table, then, they purposely made it so that we would have everybody represented. So they scattered the international students, because they, McCormick brought in international students every year, between 10 and 15, at every table. They scattered all of the Korean and African American and white students, dividing us up so that at every table, you would be your unique identity and not the majority. And then they wanted to teach us how to listen how to talk with each other. And so Eric Law has these guidelines that he teaches about respectful communication. And he conveniently gives us respect as the word to remember when we are thinking about how do we talk to each other. And the R stands for take responsibility for what you say and feel without blaming others. So in other words, your job isn't to react to what has been said. Your job isn't to get defensive when somebody says something to you. Your job is to take responsibility for your own actions, your own beliefs and feelings, to take responsibility for what you have been experiencing in that moment. And then the E of respect is to use empathetic listening. So when we're trying to listen to people, how do we listen? So I will tell you, I am very good at the American School of Education. Meaning that I have been trained by the best to be able to argue my argument so that I can tear yours apart and cut it to shreds. That's not empathetic listening. Because that means when you're speaking, I'm figuring out all the ways that what you're saying isn't right. Instead of hearing what it is you're actually saying. And so he wanted us to learn to set that American understanding of how you debate and listen aside so that we could hear and empathetically understand each other. And then in respect, the S stands for 
Be sensitive to differences in communication styles. Meaning that just because you communicate a certain way doesn't mean that that's how everybody else speaks or how they communicate or how they listen to what is being said. That we have a habit in America of kind of talking over each other and we don't often leave enough space <clears throat> for people who take time, who have to process what is being said to be able to speak. And the P stands for ponder what you feel and hear before you speak. In other words, don't just react. Don't just do what you've been trained to do of jumping in with your own thoughts but actually stop and listen to what the other person has said. E, examine your own assumptions and perceptions. That we all often believe that what we think and believe is what everybody thinks and believes or should think and believe. But we need to examine that. To think about why it is we've come to the conclusions we've come to. The C is for to keep confidentiality. Don't share everything that has been shared with the next person you encounter. Don't gossip about it. And the T stands for trust ambiguity because we are not here to debate who is right or wrong. Now, they told us those guidelines, but then they wanted us to practice it. And so they gave us a lot of really tough scenarios that we had to learn. But they taught us a method of listening to each other that I will tell you, as a white American trained in our academic system, was the most frustrating thing I have ever encountered. But it made me think and behave differently. They taught us this process of having a discussion that involved mutual invitation. So they divided us up into these groups for Bible study. And remember, I told you, it's all sorts of different people with all sorts of different names from all sorts of different places in this one location. And then told us, we had to practice mutual invitation. So, we had to know the names of everybody sitting around the table with us. Because it wasn't you share your thought and then the next person jumps in with their idea that goes along with that thought. What happened was the first person started the conversation and they then invited the next person to speak. So, you can imagine what happened the first few times, right? The people who you knew and you knew their name, that was the person you called on, right? So the white people would go and they knew all their names so they could call on the next white person because they weren't quite sure if they had the name right of the other person. But it was also a chance to diffuse things. That as we were doing these Bible studies together and having these discussions, the person who was emoting, right, the person who was impacted the most by what was being said might not be called on to talk, right? They might be skipped over for someone else. And so then they have to decide if that emoting that they're doing is actually something that they want to bring the conversation back to? Or is it something that they can let go of and release? It changed the way I thought about things. Because what it did for me was realize that if people are only calling upon the people that they know, their friends, that it ended up being this weird conversation where all the ethnic groups went in a row, right? And for me, that didn't seem like the way it should be going. That your job 
should be to look at the crowd, to look at the group around you, and see whether there was someone who needed to speak next. And not because they were emoting, but you could see that there was something that needed to be said. And know enough about them to choose them. Even if it meant you had to be embarrassed by saying, I'm not sure I remember your name, but you're the one I want to speak next. Mutual invitation is hard. But what Eric Law does in teaching us this is he wants us to realize that different cultures have different ways of speaking. And when we are in the American mode of talking on top of each other, we don't allow the people who don't have that understanding the chance to speak their thought. And so they often just stay silent the whole time. And yet that's what our story at Pentecost is about. Saying that those who didn't have the chance to speak regularly weren't invited to speak regularly now have the chance to speak. And those who normally speak over the top of each other now have the chance to listen and hear. So what's the miracle of Pentecost? It's a miracle that we cannot speak without first listening. That we cannot understand what somebody else needs to hear if we have not heard their pain, their story, have not experienced their joys and sorrows, have not heard who they are. We can't speak a truth that they can hear. And we are invited to listen. To listen and hear that word and story and thought of the other person. To hear that person who is different from us. To open up our ears. One of the examples I thought of in thinking about this is Martin Luther King Jr. was asked what he thought about all the cities that were burning up in the summer of 1968. All the uprisings that were coming and the fires that were started. And he talked to them about listening. He said that those interruptions are the language of the unheard. And what is it that America's failed to hear? We failed to hear that the plight of blacks has worsened over the last few years. We failed to hear that the promise of justice and freedom has not been met. America has failed to hear that the large segment of white society are more concerned about tranquility and status than about justice, humanity, and equality. And it's still true. Where are you today in Pentecost? Do you need to be the person who listens or the person who speaks? Do you need to be the person who hears the cries of pain, the cries for justice, the cries for change? Or do you need to be the person who speaks out the pain of your community? Who speaks out about what needs to change? What needs to be transformed? So what is the miracle of Pentecost? It's an invitation for us to hear and listen. And an invitation for us to speak. So I invite you to think about this this week. As we watch the news or listen to it, what do you hear and what don't you hear? When you watch the news, what do you need to 
do to make you see a fuller story, a greater picture. Because I thought about this as how many of you saw that young girl disrupt the tennis mat. She made it come to a stop because she wanted people to hear that in 1,000, and I think it was 28 days, we are in danger of losing the planet. We are in danger of passing a tipping point where there is no return from. <clears throat> Did you hear her speak by just standing there and disrupting something and those are the questions that we need to ask again and again. When we hear what is going on, do we have the complete story? Do we know all that we need to know about what is happening? Can we make the right decisions? Can we speak the right truth if we haven't opened up our ears to listen? <clears throat> 